The ShopSaber Pro Series CNC router is one of the most popular CNC routers in the world. Before we start on our project, let's look at why they're so popular. Well, it actually starts with the frame structures. We build the frames out of structural steel. The base is all welded one piece. We also have structural steel gantries and structural steel supports. The rigidity and the design of that frame is why we have such great edge finishes and why we have such accurate machines, and that's why these are so popular. Now, let's look at motion control. The first part of machine motion is actually defining the axis of motion, and let's look at that. What you see here are precision contour guide rails, and that's actually what causes these axes to move. But there's more to it than that. They're actually mounted to a, a machine gantry, and so the surfaces they mount to are machine, and that's what actually contributes so much to the accuracy. Since we're an American manufacturer, we have total control of all that. Now, let's see what actually makes it move. What creates the motion on the machines are actually precision ball screws, and we use them in the X, Y, and Z axis. What generates that motion are Mitsubishi closed loop servos. Now let's stop for a minute and let's talk about ball screw drives and rack and pinions because we hear that all the time and we make both so we know a whole lot about the engineering involved. First off with a typical rack and pinion there's always going to be some play that's inherent to it. There has to be backlash three to five thousandths so that they don't hang up. Well here's what happens when you're actually machining. If you're doing really precision stuff somewhere on that table that shows up you'll see a mark on an edge. We don't have that problem with ball screws because ball screws are preloaded, so there's no play in them. Now, another thing that we hear sometimes is, oh, well, we use planetary drives to take care of that rack and pinion problem. Well, that actually adds to it <laughs> because it does not replace the rack and pinion. It replaces a belt drive. Planetary drives also have play, so you're actually adding more to it. So people who tell you that that t solves that problem don't really know what they're talking about. Now, let's look at the last part of machine motion, and that's the motion control itself. We developed the ShopSaber MMP machine control based on a real robust machine control technology. In fact, MMP stands for Mitsubishi Motion Platform. But there's another part of machine control that's people related. It has to do with your operator. You know, how easy it is for the operator to run the machine every day, how easy is it to learn how to use it, uh, what kind of qualifications as a machine operator had to be. And we really wanted to create an environment where a typical worker could be successful with a machine. Let me show you how easy it is to run this machine. What I really like about the ShopSaber MMP controller is it's so easy to operate. If you look on the screen here, everything's organized in, on one screen. For instance, right up here, and this zone right here, these are all the buttons that you use to move the machine around and all the axes. Down here, these are what I call daily operational, homing the machine, setting zeros, those kinds of things. Up here, this area displays the coordinates, and, and, and actually you can, you can speed up or, or slow down a program or its RPM live while it's actually running, so it makes it really easy for the machine operator. This area displays the actual G-code file, and this area displays the actual machine. Now, let's take a look at what it takes to run this. I simply open a file, I click on this icon to view and it shows on the screen what the file looks like. Let's zoom in on that. Now for one thing I can look at that is, is that the file I thought I was going to run it? Yeah, that's absolutely it. Then all I have to do is hit cycle start and the machine runs automatically. It's a really, really simple process. Now let's take a look at the machine spindle. This machine has a HSD 10.7 horsepower ATC spindle. ATC stands for automatic tool change. We also have different horsepower spindles depending on what your machining needs are. Now let's step back and look at some of the engineering on here. For one thing, if the part fits under the gantry, we have the ability to machine it. We do that by increasing the actual uh, Z travel. Now there's an interesting development right here and we call these stiffeners and let me tell you the story behind that. We challenge engineering to come up with a design that would make the spindle stiffer when it's extended in contact with the material. So they went into our engineering software, it's finite element analysis is what it's called, and we tried several different scenarios and we found one that tested out on the software really, really good. Then we did the machine test and it, and it really proved out. Then we went back and we said, okay, now how can we achieve this same effect and reduce mass? And that's why you see these cutouts in here. That all came out of our engineering software. Now, what that does is that gives you the ability to do more 3D machining. And when you get into 3D machining, you immediately start thinking about speed. What most people don't understand is that 3D machining is determined 
by the slowest axis. So even though your machine may move around fast, if the z-axis is slow, that limits what you can do. So we started focusing on that. Here's how we did it. We put a balancing cylinder up here. Now what that does is it takes the mass of the spindle off of the ball nut. That lets us accelerate and decelerate that whole assembly much faster. That gives you really, really fast 3D machining. We call this concept Super Z technology. Now let's look at the machine table. This machine has an optional phenolic table. We also make tables in aluminum and other materials. Now, if you notice, this also has the T-slot feature. Well, what that allows you to do is to clamp special fixtures on there for machining. So just in that alone, we know that this machine has been designed for a lot of different capabilities. Now, the vacuum table itself is actually operated with these ports. And there's actually eight of them, and those ports feed into a vacuum plenum that's actually an integral part of the frame. And then that's fed back to the vacuum pump itself. All that's done with hard tubing so we don't have losses that you have with flex hose. Now, you'll notice the table is actually large, and it, it says it's five feet wide, but you'll find out on our machines that the tables are larger. That's 72 inches. The reason we do that is that gives you expandability in the future. So let's say you buy this and you decide that you want to uh, put a knife head on there or a camera or something like that. There's enough travel for that. Something else that's neat about this table also is since we machine all this with the router head, it's really, really flat and you don't have to have gasket or glue or whatever to hold your spool board down. So it makes flow through machining very, very good. A really popular feature that we have on these also are pop-up pins. This machine doesn't have them, but that's a very popular feature. Now, let's go into the office and let's look at the software. I've been wanting to do a project that actually involves more than one material for quite some time, and I found something really, really neat to show you. It's basically an LED sign. So it's, it's a wood part and it's an acrylic part, and when you put it together, you get this really neat illuminated LED sign. Now let me show you a little bit more about it. What you see on the screen here is actually the, the different parts. This is the acrylic part here. This is a base that's wood, and this is, a, actually I call it a plug, but it's basically a cap that goes underneath, and the LED lights actually mount here. Now what we're going to do is on the back side of this, we're actually going to do a 3D engrave into that plastic. And when it's all assembled and the lights turn on, that sign's really going to glow. It's a really neat project. Now let's look into these parts in a little bit more detail. The first part we'll look at is the actual base part of the LED sign. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, it's, it's a pretty good size piece of wood. To give you some scale, it's basically 42 inches long. All right, and it's got machining on top and bottom, so it's somewhat complex. Now here's, here's what's happening. We basically got a 3D surface here, which is a rounded edge. We have a surface here on the top that's going to be faced, and then we've got these slots. And one of the slots goes part of the way through, about an inch and a quarter deep, and then parts of the slots go on through. And what they do is they leave this, these little pieces here, and when the plastic panel slides down in there, that keeps them from dropping all the way through. So on one setup, we're actually going to have to do that machining. Then we're going to flip the part over. And we'll see the back side. And basically, this is going to be a pocket. So we're going to face this surface to get that flat, and then we're going to machine a pocket in there. So that's a pretty good project. Now, within that pocket goes a plug. Let's take a look at that plug. The plug part is actually fairly complicated because it has to fit in that pocket that's in the base and we also have to have a cavity to put the LED lights in and, the, and, and run the wiring. So that's what this looks like. And you can actually machine it from one side, but we're probably going to come over to the back side and fly cut that so it's perfectly flat. And then we'll do the same thing on this surface. We'll fly cut that and then we'll come in and cut our pocket and then we'll cut the perimeter. And then we'll make an accurate measurement before we take it off the machine and make sure we have our required 10 thousandths of clearance because you have to be able to take that plug in and out. Now let's look at the final part of this project and that's the acrylic. What really makes this whole project is the plastic part. Let's take a look at that. This is a piece of acrylic. It's a, about a half inch thick. The blank was 36 by 12, so it's just a little under that. What we've actually done is we've taken the Shop Saber logo and we've mirrored it. And then we're actually doing a 3D engrave with an engraving tool on the back side. And when the light comes in from underneath, that causes that sign to really illuminate. That's really what makes it neat. 
Now, once we get that done, then once again, we're going to cut the perimeter of the part out. And that's the machining that's required to do the plastic panel. Now, let's take a look at how we set this up on the machine to actually make these three parts. You know, the first thing you have to figure out is how you're going to actually hold the parts for machining. Now, these are solid wood parts, so flow through like we use on cabinet parts really doesn't work very well. So, in our case, we're going to use double stick tape. And once again, that's because we're prototyping. If we were doing a production run, we'd probably spend a little more time and make a vacuum chuck for it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to tape these parts onto a piece I call a fixture board. So it's sacrificial. It gives us a platform to align things. If you notice on the screen here, you can see the fixture board here. We're going to hold it onto the table with the T-slot system. And then um, if you notice here, I've got a pin here and one here. Those are going to be used later when we have to take that part and flip it to get it aligned. And now when we get ready to do the plastic, we're going to do the same thing. So we'll, let's, let's hide this. We'll turn our plastic part, same thing. So we're going to, once again, use that same fixture board for all three of these parts. Now, let's take a look at the actual tool pathing of each of the parts. The models on the screen are done in Rhino, but I'm actually going to tool path in VCAR Pro. So let's talk about that transition between the two. Now, you know what the fixture board is. By the way, the origin, the X0, Y0 is this corner. Now, let's turn the blank on that that part's going to be made out of, and let's look at this in a ghosted view and you'll see there's, there's about a three inch offset here. All right, now how does that relate to VCAR Pro? Well, let's go to VCAR Pro, and that's what this dimension right here is. So here's the origin. I've offset this part three inches, and that's done right here. I said use offset three inches. The material is actually seven and a half by 48 by two and seven eighths. And it's plain, but it's not perfectly flat. You can see marks from the planer, so we're going to have to fly cut that down to get that nice and, and smooth and flat. And then let's look at actually what we have here. Okay, you see a drawing here. Let's go to 3D. What you see here, this is actually that 3D model brought into to VCAR Pro. And the reason I did it is because there's a roundover around here, and we're going to create that roundover with a ball tool as a 3D surface. And then I've added actually into the 3D, I've also added a zero plane in here, and that's to determine how deep the actually ball on tool goes. I don't want it to go all the way down to the bottom. All right, and then in the 2D part, what we really have here is, is the geometry required for 2D machining. So there's a difference between 2D and 3D. So these are basically outlines for tool pass. All right, now let's look at the simulation and see what we actually did. Okay, let's go to the simulator. This is the blank. All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fly cut that. And when we fly cut it, it's going to bring it down to about, uh, about two and five eighths. Our finished thickness when we're done is going to be two and a half, but I want to take an eighth of an inch off when I flip it. So we did that first, and then I did an outline pass. And the purpose of the outline pass is to go around it. I've left about 30 thousandths for trimming, and, and we're gone just past the halfway thickness point. So we're going to go part of the way through, and when you turn it over, we'll go the other way through. Okay, then we're going to do pins. So we're going to drill holes for pins, and those are done here and here. And once again, that's so that once this is turned over, and we can align it with the pin so that the front and back align. And then we've got our 3D surface, and the first thing we're going to do is rough it out, and then we're going to do a finish pass. And that gives us that nice 3D surface. And then I've got a couple slots to cut. This one's going about an inch and a quarter deep. And then this one actually goes deeper. And what these do is they basically leave those two little tabs sticking in there so that the plastic panels uh, fits in there. Now, that completes that part. Now, the next step is to flip that over. Let's take a look at that. Okay, we've got our part flipped and aligned with the pins. Now, the next step is to do the tool pass for the back. Let's look at those. First thing I'm going to do is fly cut it, and what that does is brings it down to the finished thickness of two and a half inches. Okay, then we're going to cut our pocket in the back. And once again, that pocket is, is in there so that for electrical things. Okay, then we're going to cut the outside. And since we've cut part of the way through on the front, we've actually created a separate skeleton here that we can remove. Now, what that does is that gives us uh, access to the outside. Now, whenever we cut those outside cuts, I left about 30,000, so it's 15,000 on each side. And the reason was, sometimes when you flip apart, it's not as accurate as the machine, so sometimes it, uh, you may see a line there. So I thought, well, 
I'll just leave an allowance on there. Then I'll take a really nice finishing bit, and I'm using a, a three flute finisher, and I'll go around the perimeter of that and get a really nice edge finish so I don't have to sand much. But I also wanted, while I was doing this, to show you how we used to machine solid wood pieces because sometimes you have ingrained chipping. Now, let, let's look at that. <clears throat> We're climb cutting, all right? So here's the first tool pass is going to go across this end. If there's any chipping on the corner, it's going to be right here. Okay, then our next tool path starts here, and if there's any chipping, it'll occur there. And then we come down this edge, and then if, if there's any chips, they get eliminated. And then we follow up here, and it does the same thing if you had any chipping. So that's how you tool pass solid wood pieces. So I thought, well, I'll just include that as, as part of the process here so that you can see it. And so then we'll run those simulations. You probably won't be able to see it because it's so small. There's the first one, and the second one, and the third one. All right. So now we've got all the machining done on the base piece. Now let's take a look at what it takes to make that plug that fits inside that base. For the plug part, I first fly cut the back surface. Then I taped it to the board. And now let's take a look at, uh, at the setup. So this is the material size of the blank, 6 and 3 eighths by 40 and 7 eighths. We're a little over an inch and a half thick. We're touched off to the top of the spool board, which is the top of the fixture board. Here's our offset. So here's the origin on the machine on our fixture board, and here's where our part sits on that fixture. And once again, that number came from our original setup drawing. All right. Now let's look at actually what it took to tool path this. So let's go to simulation, and we'll look at what we did. The first thing we did is we fly cut this, once again down to final thickness, which happens to be 0.95. And that's critical because that has to fit in that pocket, which is 0.95 deep. Okay, then we machine the pocket that created that pocket. Then we did it. We roughed the outside. And then we actually, after we got that done, we did a finish pass on that. And one of the reasons I did the finish pass was because I wanted to, first off, I wanted to use a three flute finisher because I don't like to sand. Second, I wanted to be in a position where I could mic that and make sure that it fits the slot in the base piece correctly. You want about 10 thousandths of clearance in order to be able to take that in and out. Remember, there's going to be some finish involved here too. So that came out really, really nice. So that's a fairly simple setup. We like one more part before we have all our tool pathing done, and that's our plastic panel. Well, let's look at that. Now, we've actually got our plastic panel taped down to the fixture board, and once again, we use the setup drawing to determine the alignment, and that positions that uh, at three inches from the corner. This would be the origin. Uh, the material is actually 12 by 36 by a little under a half inch thick. All right, now let's look at the actual tool pathing here. Let's go to simulation, and the first thing is a V-carve tool path, and let's look at that. Now the way that's done is it's actually, uh, there's a V-bit, we're using an engraving bit that has a 90 degree included angle on it, and it goes back and forth and with a tiny step over and climbs out of the corner so they're sharp. And when you're finished, you get this. Now you might say, why is that mirror imaged? Well, think about how you view this in the LED sign. It's machined in from the back of the panel, so if you don't mirror it, it's backwards. <laughs> so that's why that's set up. Okay, so that's that first operation, and we cut about 25,000 steep with that. Then the next thing I wanted to do is, is to rough some stuff out because there's a little scrap here, and I didn't really want those scrap pieces to become projectiles when they're cut out, so I just turned them into chips. So that's what that operation did. Let's preview that. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, the next thing I wanted to do was actually cut the perimeter, and there's some rules for plastic. For one is, typically the maximum depth of cut is about the tool diameter, so if I'm using a quarter inch bit, and I'm doing half inch material, I'm going to have to go through twice. All right. So what I typically do is I make that pass and then leave about 15 thousandths and then I do a final finishing pass and that gives you a really, really, really good edge finish and the rigidity of the machine frame really shows through on that edge. Now let's look at that simulation. So here's our rough profile and here's our finish profile. Now once that's all done, we've, we've tool pathed all the parts. Now, let's actually generate the tool pass, let's send them out to machine control, and let's go make our sign.
Well, our LED sign project came out really, really nice. I wanted to do a project that had both plastic and wood. And you know what's unique about this? This concept is scalable, so you can make small signs or great big signs using these processes. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, you can contact us at shopsaber.com. Thank you for watching.